Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for joining this high-level session, uh, which is all about leading the change, empowering women and girls for a thriving rural economy. The objectives of this afternoon's session uh, are to identify public and private investments needed to mobilize, incentivize, and empower women and girls in rural uh, Africa. Uh, we will hope to look at how to strengthen cooperation between the African Union and the European Union in order to increase investments in areas such as sustainable agriculture, agribusiness, and agri-industrial development, including digitalization. We also hope to highlight ways to enhance policy dialogue and cooperation and define how to provide the most appropriate framework to create jobs and bring sustainable growth to the African rural economy. We will discuss women's access to finance, to land and extension services and ICTs and capacity development. Finally, we hope to share knowledge. Knowledge on policies and mechanisms that empower women and girls in rural areas and involve them in decision-making processes. We will also discuss how to create employment opportunities and revenue-generating activities in regions of origin and transit of migrants. So that's quite uh, a lot of discussion things we have to uh, get through this afternoon. Uh, we will finish the session at uh, 4 o'clock. Um, and I can inform you that at four o'clock, at ten past four, there will be the conclusion of the uh, EDDs in room A1. Uh, but you can also enjoy, uh, enjoy it here because it will be web streamed. So you can sit here if you prefer. Uh, so before we start, let me introduce you to our high level panel. I'll start over on my right, on your left. Uh, we have Ms. Fatma Ben Rajab. So Fatma is CEO of the Pan-African Farmers Organization. She has also been CEO of the Maghreb and North African Farmers Union and director at the Tunisian Union of Agriculture and Fisheries. She studied at the University of Tunis, where she's received a diploma of advanced studies in political science, a master's in juridical science, and amongst others, lots yes, more. Yes. Um, on uh, Fatma's left is Mr. Lyon, who is the Director General of UNIDO. Uh, he has an extensive career as a, as a senior economic and financial policymaker. He's been Vice Minister of Finance of the People's Republic of China and member of the Monetary Policy Committee of the Central Bank for more than a decade. On his left, we have the Commissioner Josefa Leonel Correa Sacco from Angola. She is the African Union Commissioner for Rural Economy and Agriculture, Special Advisor to the Vice President of the Pan-African Women Organization. She has served as a Special Advisor to the Angolan Minister of Agriculture and was Secretary General of the Inter-African Coffee Organization for 13 years. She's also worked with the National Angolan Investment Agency. Uh, on her left is Mr. Tom Arnold. Tom was chief executive of Concern Worldwide. Uh, it's Ireland's foremost humanitarian organization. Uh, in the past, Tom has also been chairman of the Irish Constitutional Convention and director of Scaling Up Nutrition. This is a movement which promotes improved nutrition across 59 countries worldwide. He's also been Director General of the Institute of International and European Affairs, which is a leading policy tank, think tank. Uh, finally, uh, we have Grace uh, ben Banda on my right here. Uh, she's a young African leader and an agripreneur from Malawi. She holds a degree in agriculture, specializing in horticulture. Uh, she's attended the Young African Leaders Initiative, and after that, she decided to combine her passion for empowering women and her expertise in agriculture to develop projects that support the participation of women in agricultural activities. Finally, we will have another guest. It's Commissioner Hogan. He will be joining us later on today. So I think I will start straight into the questions. Um, and if I may, Commissioner, I will start with you. Um, in the experience of the African Union, what, in your view, 
are the challenges faced by women uh, in agricultural activities and how can we overcome these challenges? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. I will first of all try to give uh, a short background of our mission, the mission of the African Union Commission. The African Union Commission is a support policy uh, organization. We work with our member countries to implement our Agenda 2063. Uh, this is our key mission. We also facilitate partnership uh, uh, building with technical institution and development organization. Uh, we mobilize resources for the implementation of uh, the priority program in the Agenda 2063. Uh, we also advocate uh, uh, on key social economic issues on Africa. This is our key mission in the African Union. <coughs> uh, we know that uh, a woman represents uh, more than 50% in Africa, and the key activity of women in Africa, it is agriculture sector. But this, uh, the, the work, the effort of women or the contribution of women in agriculture sector, it's not recognized. Mm -hmm. So they're still excluded. So the African Union Commission is trying to empower and uh, to empower women so that their work, their contribution they give as an agent of development on the continent should be recognized. This is really our, our, our campaign that we are doing, so that we, we have to recognize the value and the work of women in agriculture. And we know that they have a lot of challenges, and I will just bring up the key challenges women face in terms of agriculture, and the discrimination, I we call it, because women do not have access to land. We all know that some are cultural issues, but those cultural issues, we need to break the bounds because we need to really go into sustainable development and include women. We are talking about uh, women equality mm -hmm. and in our agenda, so we need to include them and see how they can have access to land. At the African Union Commission, we have uh, uh, the land policy initiative, and we are working together with UNECA on the land policy initiative. And in this land policy initiative, we have targeted at least 30% of women should have access to land by 2025. 20, uh, and this is th th that is an area where we are really working and uh, seeing time to monitor with our member countries on the implementation of the decision of our head of states. Another challenge we are facing, it is the challenge of uh, 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 finance. Yeah. Yesterday we had a, a side event, I mean a panel, where we really highlighted the issue of finance, access to finance. Because you can have good projects. If you don't have access to finance, you, win, you cannot implement your project. So the African Union Commission also set up the, women, uh, the uh, women, African Women F Fund. This fund exists, it's very operational, it has started, and there are some few countries on the continent that were able to assess and they're doing very well. We, uh, we gave some fund to U Uganda women, they benefited from, uh, they are benefiting from this fund, Malawi, Tanzania, Namibia. And the fund, I mean the basket is, uh, the envelope is from 25,000 to 30,000 uh, US dollar for a project. Yeah. So those are the areas that we are trying to mitigate uh, the, the issues of uh, discrimination on women in terms of uh, access to finance and access to, uh, to land. Another, another issue is that we are trying to work now with uh, FAO to see how we can bring research you know, for the new technology and innovation to women. Yeah. We are working on that even with the EU we, are, we started working with EU to look at the, uh, the advantage of di uh, digitalization so that women can have access to it. Of course, we have issues of infrastructure and other issues on storage and uh, post-harvest loss. All those are challenges that uh, we are trying to address. I think with, uh, with, uh, we come back again and give a, to, uh, give a chance to my colleagues here on the, on the panel. 
Thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, Director Li Yong, uh, what do you think that industrialization is the answer, um, that it can create jobs for youth, for women in particular, and bring sustainable growth in mm. Africa? Yeah. Uh, thank you, uh, Mila. The, uh, UNIDO's operation uh, is uh, really focusing on manufacturing industrialization. Uh, you all know SDG Go 9, uh, inclusive and sustainable industrialization, uh, infrastructure and uh, infrastructure uh, innovation. Now, uh, why we look at the in industrialization in Africa? Because uh, you all know that uh, least developed countries, uh, 47 of them currently, uh, two -third, uh, 36 of them located in Africa. According to the statistics, uh, those uh, least developed countries basically are growing. And if we start uh, looking at the agriculture sector, uh, doing farming as I did farming uh, before, uh, it's uh, really try to feed yourself. But if we would like to connect it to the industry through the agro-processing, agro-industry, trade capacity building, then create a value, create a job, create a high level of education, and uh, create a capacity to access to education, health, and uh, other uh, necessary resources available. So uh, based on this kind of uh, analysis information, we develop a, a program we call the Program for Country Partnership to support Africa countries uh, uh, transfer 50 years transformation uh, plan, Africa we want, and we develop uh, the uh, program together with the uh, government for industrial sector development and uh, international partners, World Bank, uh, EIB, uh, uh, A AFDB, etc., and together with the private sector, private companies. Uh, and the one of the approach we are doing is that uh, develop uh, integrated agro-industrial parks. Uh, why we always call the agriculture, uh, agriculture and the industry connected? Because uh, looking at the textile, look at the leather, look at the sesame, look at the cotton, all those uh, pro products and fruits also, uh, if uh, processed, it will create more value, especially creating more job. Uh, in the rural areas, uh, according to our analysis, big majority of women can access to the job creation uh, through this kind of approach. Uh, because uh, advanced countries, they, more than 90% of the agriculture products are processed but in least developed countries, I can less than 30% of the agro produce being processed. So you see the gap between that. Our program exactly fit into niche and to create a job for. According to our uh, programs in Ethiopia, those uh, integrated agro industrial park really creating jobs because a big majority of job created uh, in the parks, uh, women, young ladies. Uh, those uh, uh, industrial parks in Senegal, uh, we call it Agropol, uh, three of them, and then many in other in Congo, Ghana, and the many other countries actually exactly follow this kind of case. So this is a, a kind of approach we are doing to support job creation for women, for young people, uh, in large scale. We are not talking about a few hundred, a large scale. Maybe, uh, maybe I can talk to one of them, one of these young yeah. ladies here. Okay. Grace, uh, what do you need as a young entrepreneur? What do you think young entrepreneurs need uh, in order to expand their business or to start up their business? Okay, thank you so much for the question. I would say young leaders are not leaders of tomorrow, as everybody says. 
We are leaders of today and tomorrow. And if you support a young leader today, you are supporting the world of today. I'm a young social entrepreneur who is much interested in training women, rural women and girls, in the production of spices and herbs. And we do this in the rural areas in my country. And after training them, we process the products into high value added products. One of the products we are processing is contraceptives, which is made from Molinga plant. Molinga plant is a plant mostly is grown in Africa. It's a tree which is nutritious. And we use this herb to make contraceptives. Afterwards, then we, I find markets for the rural women and girls for their development. But to be honest, it has not been easy. Like training rural women, it has not been easy because we are dealing with scientific things. Training people about plants, about flowers, it's a scientific thing. So training people who are not educated, it's not easy. And also, as the commissioner said, in Africa, it is hard for women to have a land. Yes, I train these women, but after training, where can we get the land? Where can these people, after being trained, are they going to practice what we have trained them? But also, it is hard lack of support. Like for us, after training these women, we make the products. But for people to support us, it is hard because they say, with the technologies of nowadays, when we say we are producing natural things, it is hard for people to, to take it and to believe in it. But I believe that rural women, if we empower them, then we are changing the community. Because if only we can invest in the rural women by providing land for them, by providing anything that can help them to grow their business, I'm sure they can prosper. And also by funding them. Funding doesn't only mean giving them money, but even if you buy their products, that's enough funding for them. So I'm standing here to say, we are having problems with the rural women, mostly with the land, with the support, with funding, and even with machinery to process the products. So I believe if we hold hands together and empower women, we, we are empowering the community. Thank you. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Very good. <laughs> Fatma, um, you, you represent the farmers organization. Um, what do you think uh, are the obstacles that are in place? Um, we've just heard uh, from Grace about land, access to land, access to funding, how difficult it is to train. Um, but what, in your view, are the obstacles that prevent young uh, entrepreneurs like Grace from, from growing a business? Merci, je vous remercie. En fait, je vais commencer. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'm going to start with potential, opportunities available, and uh, followed by the challenges. The potential is that, first of all, you must be aware, you must know that African rural women are the main guarantors for food and nutritional safety. And security. Now, mainly through the whole, they are part of the whole change, uh, chain from uh, growing the land, uh, to growing the crops, uh, harvesting, and the first processing. So they are mainly the guarantors of the well being of their family. The second potential is political will. There are international treaties. There are decisions uh, with, that have been made within the African Union. There are laws, there are regulations. All this exists. However, the real challenge is the actual implementation, the, po the possibility of 
putting into practice all these uh, decisions, implementing all these, this, all these political ideas, the rural level. Now, we've talked about access to new technologies, to financing, to land, to whatever. All this has been discussed uh, at length uh, through uh, many uh, meetings. But, but what we must remember is that rural development must be integrated and it must be entire. You can't just think only of direct needs, but, ec but the further needs of uh, uh, rural women and young girls also access to education and health to culture, to infrastructure. When you talk about infrastructure, it's not just a question of building roads in rural areas, but also consider everything that goes hand in hand with culture so that we can keep young girls in the rural areas. The second challenge is really having women's representation in leadership positions. We see more and more women taking certain posts, reaching the negotiation level, the implementation level, the evaluation of agricultural and rural policies, but it's still not enough. If we really want to talk about the challenges women have to face, it must be women themselves that should have access, direct access to these leadership positions. And the difficulty there, at least in Africa, remains. It's a question of customs, because women in certain regions still find it difficult with their men, with their husbands, with their fathers, with their brothers, find it difficult to have access to a leadership position, to uh, break out of the family, uh, out of this cocoon, and be in a position where they can uh, make their voice heard and be there on the scene. So that's the real challenge. That's where APAFO has tried through its member organizations to deal with part of these, or face part of these challenges. Thank you. Well, I realized that recently the European Commission, the European Commission of the European Union have established a task force for rural Africa. Um, Tom, I think you will be heading, uh, leading up this uh, task force. Maybe you could uh, give us a couple of words um, about the task force and where, especially where women empowerment is, co is concerned. Well, the task force fits squarely within the wider political partnership between the African Union and the European Union. And that was very much personified when the task force was launched. You had Commissioner Hogan and Commissioner Mimica from, from the European Commission and Commissioner Sacco from the, from the African Union. So it very much fits within that and it fits within whatever uh, commitments the European Union and the African Union are going to make on empowerment mm. and these women's empowerment. And these last two days, I think, are very significant here. And there's going to be a job of work to be done to draw out from these two very stimulating and challenging days and say what this is going to mean in political and policy terms. But on the task force itself, if I could summarize in one sentence what it's, uh, it's going to try to do, it's going to look at how rural Africa should be transformed, uh, particularly with a focus on increasing employment. I think maybe that's a very s s short definition, but I think it's one that would serve us well. And within that, there's a particular question as to what role women, is going to women are going to, pl to play. We had the first meeting of the task force on the 24th of May. We were very much just getting to know each other and sketching out the work program ahead. But one very clear message coming from the members, and particularly the female members, was that women, the role of women in this agenda has to be very significant. And now the challenge for us over the coming months will be how do you translate that high level worthy aspiration into a practical 
policy agenda. That's ahead of us. I'm not going to speculate on what's going to be in that, but it's going to have to address the sort of uh, challenges that the Commissioner referred to earlier about access of resources to land, to finance, and other, other things. So that's, as I see it, uh, where we are at, our starting point anyway. Okay, good. Um, I think at this stage I will do a, a quick second round of questions before we go out to the audience. Uh, um, so if I may, um, I come back to you, Commissioner. Um, tell me, have you got any success stories to share with us um, on incentivizing women's access, access to finance or to land or uh, extension services in Africa? Thank you. Uh, the success story, as I told you, today, uh, access to land, we have uh, uh, the African uh, EU, uh, no, uh, United Nations uh, uh, African Union uh, Land Policy Center, and we are working on uh, key uh, policy and implement it with our member countries. I consider that as a successful story. Mm -hmm. Another successful story we can uh, uh, talk about in Africa is the implementation of uh, Maputo Protocol. We are working with member countries in order to domesticate the Maputo uh, Protocol and implement it at the, at the national level and uh, at the re regional and continental level. So this is a successful story. We, we are seeing that a lot of progress has been uh, uh, trapped by uh, this uh, Maputo protocol. We also have the Solen Declaration on Gender Equity uh, in Africa. Uh, this, this is also a tool that uh, we are really uh, working with member countries for the real uh, implementation, ratification, and domestication in the, in the national, uh, uh, national development plan. Uh, the third one is this, uh, the successful story is for the first time the African Union Commission came out with a global agenda, which is the agenda 2063, and we are really working hard, you know, to implement. And we are implementing, and a lot of uh, success has been there. And uh, finally, the success story that we can see in terms of uh, women equity. African Union is the only African, uh, uh, only institution that has parity. Mm. So, as I can see, our our executive, the the commissioners on the African Union, we are parity. It's 50-50. Uh, Even EU or United Nations, they are not applying par parity. We are applying parity, and we want to mainstream it in all the departments so that women uh, can have, you know, access to to power, she can be at the, at the leading area where she can defend and represent our own worries. So this is really a key, uh, you know, a, a very good success uh, story of the African Union Commission. We are the only institution, continental institution in the, in the world that has a parity on its own organ, you know, yeah, thank you. Very good, thank you. May, may I ask another question, a short one? Why Agenda 2063? We have uh, Agenda 2063 because uh, when the African Union Commission, uh, African Union, African Unity was created, uh, the, the, agenda, the dynamic was different. It was created to liberate uh, Africa for independence, apartheid, all this. So it was another era. So 50 years after the existence of African Union, we want to go into the development. That is why our head of state created the Agenda 2063. It is a mega agenda for the next 50 years. But this agenda, it is aligned, it is aligned with the, the SDG. SDG. It is okay. aligned with the Development Sustainable uh, Agenda because we are part of uh, the Sustainable Development Agenda. So, but since the specificity of this part of the globe that we decided to look at our own problem and build on our own, uh, our own uh, development agenda, that is why we have Agenda 2063. On the, this agenda, we have a strategic plan, which is 10-year strategic plan. Right. So we start today. You know, we start working for the future generation. 
Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, we've heard about how important it is to have funding, to have financing and access to finance. So, um, um, Lee Jung, may I ask you, how do you think or how can you imagine access to finance being made more f easily available, from both from public and private sectors? Have you any um, advice yeah. on that? Uh, this is a, a big challenge uh, for international community, uh, at the same time also for the uh, government and the private sector. Uh, you need a program actually not to involve too much of the uh, uh, providing financing, be basically uh, manufacturing, industry, job creation. Uh, but now uh, we are very happy uh, ACP EU uh, developed some programs uh, to support the, the, this kind of uh, uh, financing uh, access could be accessible uh, to the local community. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, the financing for uh, those uh, startups, for women, for the, should be a kind of joint cooperation from international community, first uh, developing institutions, uh, the soft loans, soft uh, the free money, uh, mixed uh, loans, uh, and second is the government. Government has responsibility uh, to support this uh, small business and uh, startups, especially for women in the poor region, and uh, with some of the subsidies on the interest or so. Uh, financial institutions also could develop a kind of approach, uh, work together with government, with international community to provide this kind of financing. Uh, I uh, think lots of good uh, examples already happen in the world. So in Africa, uh, I've seen like IFC, World Bank Group, uh, ERB now, we uh, would like to have a joint cooperation to, to do something in this area. Uh, and uh, it will be a big challenge, still big challenge for international community. Uh, but uh, it's uh, so critical. If uh, uh, I just joined a lunch event, and also I heard uh, by one intervention from Africa speaker as a capacity to access to the energy, health, water, and the other resources is uh, very, very important. Fundamentally, it's uh, through the job creation, income generation, but financing will be critical uh, in this juncture. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Um, what about you, Fatima? What do you think about digitalization? Um, is, the, is the digitalization agenda um, at reach for, for African women uh, farmers? And uh, does it actually offer new opportunities for these uh, women? Uh, certainly. Certainly. Là, uh, certainly. This is a strategy, a, a program of... Uh, helping women to get into uh, strategic value range, to have greater performance and profitability. At the last summit between the African Union and the European Union, a decision was taken to implement a platform of uh, agribusiness. And I think that really helping people farmers get, them to involve, get involved in such a platform because they're the primary actors of the uh, agro-industrial uh, sector. It's very good. And there's different levels of different types of rural women. The level of illiterate women, let's say, they don't have easy access to digitalization. So we need to have proper incentives, training, support, intensive support, which needs to be put in place. The second level are young girls, school leavers. They have enormous potential for rural areas, not just in terms of purely agricultural activities, but in all different activities which go along with it, in services, 
in all of the accompanying s services. Then we have women entrepreneurs. Um, there are a num numerous examples, many examples of women entrepreneurs who've succeeded by their own means, by having access to financing all by themselves, having contacts with scientific research, by improving their product productivity, who have prospered at local level, at, at national region level, and who are exporting but on their own means. So there are different levels. There's certainly need for investment, for scaling, for reproduction of the good practices of success stories, for support, more support, to those who need to, the support. And I think there is great potential both at the level of agricultural organizations, in terms of technical and financial partnerships, in terms of political will. All of this cooperation, these elements together, there's certainly possibilities to access resources and new technology and digitalization. And you don't need to have big companies necessarily, and I would stress that we are really uh, agricultural uh, organizations. There is the private sector, but you do need to differentiate a bit from the private sector from the big multinationals, the large scale multinationals. You need to differentiate. We're not NGOs. We're not the classical private sector. It's the private sector that you need to take for its true value. So we take the partnerships Part, uh, private partner, private public agricultural, because there are value added that can be brought out for by for and by agricult uh, farmers and agricultural organisations. Thank you. What you've said is really important because indeed what we what we need here, what perhaps the the, the element missing from this discussion is an industry, somebody, a big company. Um, we have public and private, but as you say, it's a sort of a, a sector that we should take a little bit aside from. It's not the private uh, big industry, um, which I think should be particularly involved in, in trying to kickstart some of the, uh, the and, and, and face some of the challenges you've been mentioning. Um, Grace, what do you think? Do you think that uh, the next generation of farmers will? Uh, will will have a will have less challenges or what will they need to be successful? Will the opportunities be the same? Will they be bigger and better? Okay, thank you. I'd say with more than sixty percent of one point one six six billion people living in the rural areas in Africa, Africa still depends on agriculture for its economy. And that a two percent GDP of Africa is agriculture. But it is so sad that Africa will still export less and import more of agricultural products. But there's a reason, because Africa, we use local agriculture systems. I'll give you from my example. I train women, rural women, on the production of spices and herbs. Yes, the production is okay. But when we come to the processing, it is really a mess. Because of the lack of industrial facilities, the agricultural processing systems, it is hard. So if only there can be the development of agricultural systems in the rural areas, if there can be agro-processing systems or incubators, any technologies in agriculture sectors in the rural areas, then I'm positive that Africa in the next generation it can prosper enough in farming. Because I believe Africans, our economy rise in the soil. So if we improve the agriculture sector, then we know that even our economy is going to be improved. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tom, another question for you. In, you've had some experience already in Africa and a lot of experience worldwide with in your, when you were uh, heading up Concern. Um, have you any concrete examples that you can talk about uh, that have, of things that have really empowered women on, in the field? 
I think there are cases where, particularly where extension services are focused in a realistic way on women, that can, can help. Um, I think there's a big challenge to make sure that uh, women entrepreneurs are uh, enabled and encouraged to start up small businesses. I think that's really, that's really very important. Um, and, you know, part of the answer to rural and transformation is certainly increasing productivity at the farm level but it's increasing productivity beyond the farm level as well, increasing the value that African agriculture is adding to its food. And I think women are going to have a particular role to play in that regard because they are so closely connected to the food sector, both in the producing, the processing, and, and the selling of it. Okay, well, thank you. I think what I'll do now is I'll take some questions perhaps from the floor. I already, we'll do it on a hands-up basis, um, <coughs> this gentleman in the front seat, thank you. And perhaps you would like to introduce yourself and uh, say who your question is directed to. Thank you, my name is Michael Hailu, I'm uh, Director of uh, CTA, Technical Centre for Agricultural and Rural Cooperation. So my question is uh, to Mr. Lee Young, uh, he talked about the industrial parks, and the question I have, agro-industrial parks uh, that we uh, established in different places. The question I have is, these are fairly high investments uh, from governments and uh, probably development partners as well. Yeah. The question is, how do we maximize, uh, perhaps even to uh, hear from Unidos experience, how to maximize the benefit for smallholder producers you know, to link up through value chains and in terms of also creating jobs for young people, in particular women, you know, what are the experiences in terms of maximizing these benefits from the agro-industrial parks? Thank you. Hmm. Please. Yeah. Uh, thank you for uh, this question. Uh, uh, I think uh, just now I didn't have enough time to uh, explain that uh, what kind of benefit from the, this kind of parks uh, I give you one of the examples, uh, the uh, four integrated agro-industrial parks established in Ethiopia and the three agro posts in Senegal. And one of the examples I could give you is last year we launched a park that uh, should create 134,000 new jobs in the region. I visited uh, uh, Havasa Park uh, which are completed within one year and uh, were well, supposed to create 90,000 jobs uh, if it is in full swing uh, in a southern part of Ethiopia. And uh, uh, regarding the investment of the uh, parks, uh, it's a kind of a joint cooperation, uh, partially could be owned by the government as a, like a mojo led the park in Ethiopia, owned by government, government uh, make investment uh, for logistics and also other uh, necessities, and the company move in just manufacturing. Uh, and some parks actually contracted to the private company. They run the company, uh, company run the park, and uh, also invite the company to come in, uh, make manufacturing, also pay the rent. Uh, some of those uh, the actually uh, the, by development banks. Uh, I uh, heard World Bank uh, are now investing for the technology park with 250 million. Uh, EIB also discussed the potentials to make an a independent ladder park uh, in Ethiopia with a total amount uh, approximately uh, altogether 100 million euros. So those are the uh, uh, diversification of the investment and also the private sector is uh, important. Why I said important because they come in, bring the technology, uh, textile, leather, uh, machinery. Second is uh, training. They need the workers, they will bring the training. And see the money, the, uh, some money to initiate manufacturing. 
and the most important is access to market because uh, they will find the market uh, part. This is why the private sector play a very important role. Government need to play the role, create a conducive environment for private sector to come in, uh, investment law to protect uh, the uh, private sector, and also create the logistics, uh, quick approval, or the one-stop shopping, those kind of things created. Uh, I think now we are moving uh, uh, this kind of industrial park around the continent. Uh, we are very happy this is a great moment for us to move ahead with our agenda. But 2063, uh, IDDA3, I -I uh, Third Industrial Development Decade for Africa, that was created by U UN General Assembly Resolution. You need to be selected as a leading agency to, take, to cooperate with international partners. G20 created uh, African industrialization, and others also uh, bilaterally uh, support okay. Africa. I'll, I'll so it, this is a great opportunity to move ahead with this kind of new approach. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I've just been informed that the commission has arrived, but there's probably time for one quick question, if anyone has. Yes, the young lady in blue over there. Thank um, you. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Eva Engstrom, and I'm here representing the Youth Ag Summit with Bioag. And my question also relates to this industrial parks. And I'm wondering more about the transfer of the educational capacities that come with it. Because within the industry, even if people are hired and it's producing jobs, do we see especially women being hired in those positions where they're being trained in skills which will allow them to go forth and actually produce new innovative endeavors? Because even if they're working but they're not being taught those skills, they're not going to be able to you know, produce further innovation that will help in the region. Yeah. Sorry, to who did you address your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> it also to Liang. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, thank you for giving me more opportunity. <laughs> uh, this is uh, one issue uh, we are uh, uh, already started with uh, support for training for entrepreneurs, uh, especially those uh, uh, industrial parks. We I visit myself, uh, Mojo Leather Park. I I'm seeing the big majority of the workers hide uh, young lady, uh, women. Uh, you, this is very encouraging for us to see. We uh, provide some kind of trainings uh, through our programs. Like uh, in Nigeria, I give you examples. And this kind of project is a UNIDO HP Learning Initiative for Entrepreneurs. And the project will train 205 teachers in 41 selected senior secondary school, including 11 technical vocational school. So uh, the project aims to reach out 166,000 young men and women to create 40,000 jobs. Uh, and we have a large number of uh, entrepreneurship curriculum program in 11 countries. Uh, for instance, in Uganda, 1.4 million students in 2,400 schools. And Namibia has 150,000 students in 624 schools. And Rwanda is uh, actually 550,000 students in 1,600. So 11 countries, they have a large program for training for entrepreneurs. That is uh, our uh, traditional program. We will move ahead uh, combined with uh, private sector training because they are necessary to start with manufacturing. So uh, national program for vocational training is also part of our support programs. So combination with those, we have uh, developed such kind of program very strongly to help the young people, women, to have the capacity to seek the job. Thank you. Th thank you very much. Um, a pause for a moment while we welcome Commissioner Hogan, who has just arrived. Good afternoon, Commissioner. Please take a seat. So 
So we've been having a very interesting discussion um, on this uh, uh, high-level panel, Commissioner. Um, I'm, I know that you have a couple of words to say to us. Perhaps we could start with, with that. Thank you very much, uh, Mela, and uh, it's great to see all the friends here on the panel. And uh, Madam Sacco, uh, dear friends, I welcome this opportunity to discuss how we can empower and strengthen the role of women in the context of uh, developing the African rural economy. And uh, I have been listening a little bit to the panel, and uh, given that we are now translating into concrete action the decisions that were taken uh, at the fifth Africa E European Union summit in Abidjan last November, the question of agriculture and rural development, of course, is very high on our joint agenda. Agriculture, as you know, plays a substantial part in the 2030 agenda, but we're still at the start of a long journey to achieving the sustainable development goals at global level. And this gives agriculture and our policy in agriculture an opportunity uh, to be part of the solution uh, in the EU and even more so in Africa. So I'm very much aware of the role that women and uh, girls must play in our strategies if we are to succeed. And we urgently need to find smarter ways to unleash the full potential in relation to rural development in Africa and farming. So I want to focus on five areas briefly where we need action in order to bridge the gap between opportunity and reality between the theory and the practice. And these five areas, I believe, can deepen our partnership between the European Union and Africa. The first is skills and education. In Africa, we need to focus on in investing in skills and productive capacity, similarly to Europe. And we have to empower women and young people in particular with the necessary expertise to build careers in the sector. We need to facilitate their access to new technologies, new capital, and we must support entrepreneurship and self-employment. And I know that you have heard some very good examples already today. Policies and investments that tackle gender-specific constraints and promote vocational training in agriculture and the food industry could have a particularly major impact on women's economic activity and on food security. The second area for action is agribusiness. I support the project that's aiming to establish the African Union, European Union agribusiness platform. This platform will strengthen the links between the food and drink industry in Africa and Europe. Ultimately, it will also help African entrepreneurs, both women and men, both smallholders and family farmers, by providing better access to markets. Thirdly, is in relation to quality products, or we have in Europe a system called geographical indications. Quality standards are very important for market access, and there's a lot of work that we can do together here. It has been a very successful model in the European Union, and quality is a hugely important symbol of food product, quality food production, where African farmers, in our uh, view, have a huge potential. It's a symbol of excellence and quality, the geographical indications. Fourthly, the third area for action is digital transformation. New technologies and systems can radically improve agricultural productivity and help the environment. We should aim to support the connectivity of smallholders to the internet, increase the uptake of advisory services, and extend the availability of e-agriculture solutions in Africa as well as in Europe. And the fifth area for action is research. We should enhance our collaborative research and innovation activities between Europe and Africa. This will provide the technological know-how for both Africa and Europe to be able to do more and respectful of environment and sustainability. And it includes professional development as well and exchange programs. So all of these ideas are not new because we have discussed them uh, at the ministerial conference which the African Union and the European Union had uh, in July 2017 in Rome and we are jointly bringing them together. And they also ha uh, have, it so happens, under the chairmanship of Tom Arnold, that we have the Rural Africa Task Force, and we're bringing these ideas together for action. Now, this task force is going to provide an overview of what needs to happen and provide some recommendations by the end of this year or early next year. 
and I look forward to the practical re recommendations that we can have. And we have started rethinking our traditional development cooperation models as well. And beyond development assistance and trade relations, we are now focusing uh, on targeting policy support and political dialogue. And we are also prioritizing the fostering of responsible investments in rural areas with the involvement of the private sector under the framework of the external investment program. The external investment plan expects to mobilize huge investment, at least 44 billion euro of investment in Africa and the European neighborhood by 2020. As you know, there, there is a window under this program for agriculture and agribusiness, and it is also a priority of the African Union to transform their agricultural sector in order to unlock the potential to help feed and employ an increasing numbers of people in agriculture and agribusiness, particularly young people. So now it's up to all of the players, it's up to all of us to work together on the basis of this agenda. Uh, it will provide sustainable growth and decent jobs if we can succeed. Uh, but financial guarantees are only one part. Ensuring the right business and regulatory conditions for investments to flourish is just as important to turn these new investments into lasting ones. So we want to look at how we can help with technical assistance early on in the programmes and early on in the investments to make them last uh, at the early stages, which is the most difficult phase. So investment will create jobs and keep families in rural communities. So to conclude, Madam, uh, we have to realise the potential of agriculture. Agriculture is in a very important role to play in, uh, as a sector in Africa, as it is in the European Union. We have to tap into this because this is going to uh, provide much needed jobs for women, for young girls and for young people generally. And we have to achieve this through sound public policies and good partnerships. And uh, we have to be responsible investments and build a sustainable agricultural sector. The successful development of these particular opportunities in agriculture and food are very challenging, uh, but very important in order to ensure uh, that people can live, work, and hopefully have sufficient food for the growing populations that we have in our neighbourhood. And by working together between the European uh, uh, Union and African Union, as we are, we can achieve a lot. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We, we did meet in Rome in July 17. We met again in Abidjan in, uh, in November, I think, of last year. Yeah. Um, uh, and I can understand you opened saying that we need to bridge the gap between the speak and the practice. So we, we've discussed, uh, we, we've come up with plans. There's the task force, which I think is a, a really good step in the right direction. But how do you think, what's the first step to really make, some, to make a difference? Um, at, what, what should we be doing in order to, to really bring out what we've been talking about into practice on the, on the ground? Well, I suppose the great frustration about being involved in uh, any effort to, to uh, improve situations is that the level of time it takes from the plans uh, uh, to be put into action. Uh, and we have a l many plans. I think we have enough plans. I think Madam Sacco would agree with me with this. We have plenty of plans, but so now we want to see the action. So the external investment plan was the first bit of the action in November where we're trying to mobilize some financial resources. You cannot do anything without investments in financial resources. And we have to develop the programs as quickly as possible, but also have them sustainably. And I believe the technical assistance part here to these programs are very important because it's no good having programs and having actions and individuals and companies starting up and they don't get the necessary early help uh, for the first two or three years, otherwise they won't last. Uh, the second thing is that I, I really think that the five areas of action that we agreed in Abidjan, if we can implement those over the next year and a half, uh, I'm setting a very ambitious time scale because I have a, another year and a half of my mandate, <laughs> uh, but if I can set a, set a very strong target on these five areas, on research and innovation, on the in, uh, external investment plan, on vocational training, I, I, and these are the main issues I, um, on the agenda that we can do a lot in the sh and the, we, we have the plans, we have the way we want to do it and we have, again we are working closely on responsible investments in Africa uh, and we need reliable partners on both sides and I think we are working closely on this at the moment to make sure uh, that we get this early stages right. Very good, thank you. Um, 
we, before you arrived, Commissioner, we were taking some questions from the floor, so I'll go back to the audience oh, yeah. to see. Yes, there's a gentleman here uh, in the second row with his hand up. Please introduce yourself and, and uh, say to whom you're addressing your yes. question. Yes, good afternoon. Yeah. Michel yeah. Lavoli, Public-Private Partnerships Europe. Uh, if I could uh, inject in the discussion uh, a, a sense of urgency about some of these issues that you're trying to tackle, and probably there's a hierarchy uh, that you can apply. Uh, I want to make a reference to the OECD report uh, from the West Africa Sahel group of a few weeks ago that actually uh, describes a situation of increased food insecurity in most of the Sahel countries uh, and predicting that it's just going to get worse, which leads to uh, the challenge of climate, obviously, that we haven't heard much about uh, in these discussions. And uh, the uh, central gap that they are identifying is the lack of data the lack of information for predicting and making decisions on uh, the whole agriculture uh, cycle. And, and the countries that are described, or Senegal, where you're describing this uh, important uh, investment, but in parallel, food insecurity is growing. Northern Nigeria is, is, is suffering tremendously with 3.7 million food insecure uh, individuals. So uh, what I want to convey is that uh, there is uh, urgency in doing certain things that could very much help the situation. And uh, you need to spend a bit of time addressing these issues. Well, thank you. I think that was more of a statement than a question. Would, Would you I, like I, to reply? I think I share very much what the speaker has and what the questioner has said. And this is why I hope that Tom, I'm not putting a big challenge in Tom Ireland's mm. team uh, of, of, of 11 experts, but uh, there is a challenge here for to get on with the job of actually identifying the practical issues and recommendations that we can urgently implement. I agree with, totally with you. This is why Mr. Sacco and I in Abidjan we, and Rome in July we, we, we just didn't hang about, really. We, the fact is we have some of these recommendations implemented already and up and running is an indication that we share your impatience. Commissioner Sacco, you want to intervene? Yes, I want to share the same uh, uh, issue with, uh, about concerning data. Uh, we, just, uh, fini we just presented our report on the status of the implementation of African countries vis-à-vis uh, -vis the Malabo Declaration, our flagship program, and we encountered a lot of gap in terms of uh, uh, accurate data, mostly concerning gender, because we have now our, we, we adopted our review report, our biannual review reports to our head of states, and uh, we had uh, about 47 countries that presented their reports. Today we can say we are happy, we have the status of implementation of Malabo Declaration on 45, uh, uh, 43 indicators on our, on our flagship program, but there's still an issue of data, and I think we need to strengthen, you know, and have credible data, so that in future, when we're going to present our next edition of 2020 uh, by annual review report, we'll be more precise and we include more indicators, mostly in terms of the, 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 the conversation we are having here concerning gender. There's really a gap on uh, data information. I thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah, Tom. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I very much share Michael's comment here. I think there's a huge issue about which there is big uncertainty, and that is the longer-term influence of climate change. And we're going to have to be aware of that and prepare for it. But even with the current insufficiency of data, we know enough of the current si about the current situation that more countries need to start investing in what would co under the general heading of resilience, building the capacity of communities to withstand crises, small or large. And that's an area where I think 
between the, both in terms of development policy and in terms of wider cooperation between the African Union and the European Union, there needs to be more emphasis on the next five years. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. There's a, a lady at the back who would like to uh, ask a question. Oh, thank you. First, I would like to compliment all the speakers. This is a very important issue to us entrepreneurs. And most of the questions or comments have been done by my colleagues who are talking to Mr. Long, Ling. But I still want to add a little point which I hear from the young leader from Malawi who is tracing the issue of how she can come from where she is and to move forward or to go up. That is what I was trying to see. I'm hearing a very good point from the commissioner. Thank you very much. But I see there's a need of a smart, affordable industrial park. Smart, affordable industrial parks for the entrepreneurs or rural areas. Meaning we don't go for the big industries. We have training centers which are small, affordable, plus the industrial parks which are affordable that well women can still work at home and still go to the industrial parks and do some work. Next, we'll have products ready, but where's the market? So meaning we'll need to have trade centers also. This is what was my, in, uh, my advice to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> comments? Have, yes, yeah, please. Could I, uh, 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 yeah. I really appreciate a very good comment uh, about that. Uh, we develop a different strategy uh, according to the local situation, uh, because uh, industrial park, some uh, big size, some small size, uh, and uh, exactly uh, uh, suitable uh, to the local situation, local farming produce or so, and uh, uh, that uh, is a kind of approach we're doing. We also look at the possibility for the green industrial parks and the green jobs uh, sustainable jobs. So those are the, uh, but one of the issue additionally, now we've seen very good uh, uh, examples now being developed. Those workers uh, circling around, they worked in the industrial park and uh, later on they move around to find the higher salary jobs in some other parks. And this is a labor market created. And also, one of the uh, useful uh, practices is that, uh, like shoe making, the shoe mold is uh, te technology. Uh, workers, young people, learn the shoe, ma shoe mold making and uh, create, can create their own shoe company. So this is uh, also a kind of uh, very good uh, uh, spreading of the matured labors around the same. So let, uh, let us create a momentum. Then we can have jobs, we can support the women, we can have the labor market raise the income. Uh, and practice footed on the ground. Uh, this is uh, what uh, we are doing. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Fatma, you wanted to add something. Oui, un point très important. Je voulais intervenir on... It's a very interesting point. I wanted to add something on access to the market, which is definitely tied to this. From a political point of view, continental and regional organization is essential. It's a question of sovereignty in countries. But I think that if we don't become aware of the fact that integration is the future of Africa, it will not be possible, neither for the small farmers nor for big farmers, to do anything. Merci. Je voulais juste... Thank you. Yes, I just wanted to answer to what the, add to what the colleague just said on regional integration. Inform, exchange information. In the African Union, we're already working on this. We've created a free trade area last month in Kigali. So we're on the right road, and we are aware of the importance and the impact an area of this kind can have on intra-African trade, and also for poverty reduction and setting and creating jobs. Thank you. We have time for another quick uh, couple of questions. Any questions from the floor? Uh, no. Perhaps um, 
some of the panel, panelists would like to ask a question to another panelist. If not, I have my own question, but uh, I can wait. You'll go with yours. I'll go with mine. <laughs> um, how do we get um, the, the industry, the European industry, to play a, a more direct role? Um, when I speak to some of my colleagues in the European food uh, and drink industry, um, I hear of the challenges. I have, of course, there are many opportunities, but I also hear of the challenges, and some of them are linked to um, the regulatory aspects or lack of certainty in doing business uh, in some African countries. So what can we do to bring some sort of um, peace of mind to, to European uh, businesses before they uh, can invest or will invest in Africa? So. Perhaps to you, Commissioner Sacco, I can pose this question, and then perhaps to, uh, for, to Commissioner Hogan. Uh, it, is a very uh, it is a very good, important question. Uh, we really need to uh, encourage the European to share lessons with us and come and invest. But we are also aware that at the continent we have a lot of constraints, so we need to create a conducive you know, a conducive business uh, uh, environment to attract the foreign investment. I know that uh, a lot of uh, countries today, they have uh, foreign investment law, law, but it should be more attractive and to really be credible so that the uh, uh, industrial in this part of the, the, the planet can come and invest with all the guarantee that uh, they are doing business, you know, but a win-win uh, type of business between yeah. the two, uh, the, the two uh, parts of the globe, Europe and uh, Africa. Thank you. Commissioner, did you want to add something? Well, there is a great opportunity, I believe, for African businesses to, to do well in the European Union, particularly on uh, specific product lines where we have duty-free, tariff-free access to a big 500 million market. Uh, I think this is a wonderful opportunity. But of course, uh, the seed capital uh, is needed uh, for many people who have an, an idea. Uh, and building on uh, Unido's industrial park model is one way, but also individuals, of course. Uh, and not everybody can be in an industrial park, even though it's a big initiative that Unido have rightly uh, uh, carried out and are making a lot of progress and a lot of good jobs. But I think we have to target the individuals and therefore uh, helping people to help themselves initially on the ground uh, in, uh, is something that we are looking forward to, few, to continued cooperation with the African Union to try and develop programs around this through the external investment program that we have now. And, and we have, I see as well, the EU, um, AU agribusiness platform that is being set up. So I expect this will be a place where we can sit and talk to each other. Yes. Uh, the industries, the agribusiness industries on both sides, so that we can... Yes, well, this is one of the five initiatives yeah. that we mentioned earlier yeah. that we have agreed. And uh, technology, of course, is uh, becoming more and more important uh, on the digital side as well as the technological side. It's a question of sharing this and sharing best practice and uh, we are willing and, uh, and, and, and able to cooperate. And I look forward to the additional recommendations then that Tom and his team will come up with at the end of the year to see how we can even do more. But mm -hmm. the new technologies, the new platforms that we're developing are going to be a good way in which people can interact and interrelate with each other and do business. Thank you. Okay, one last chance for questions before I try and conclude to this afternoon. No? Any additional remarks from the panel? Okay, so I've taken some notes and I will try to conclude. It's been a, a very interesting discussion. Thank you all very much for, for coming. Um, so the panel was uh, a session on leading the change, empowering women and girls for a thriving rural economy. And we've seen that the linkage between agriculture and agri-industry is essential to address food insecurity and the economic transformation in Africa. Uh, promoting access to land, promoting fin financial inclusion as well as private instruments are essential to the empowerment of women and, and girls in rural areas and to their meaningful participation in agricultural economic activities. Successful development of the uh, untapped unemployment and the production potential for uh, agriculture and food requires, I think, um, 
a, a very focused job strategy, uh, in particular for women and girls across the continent. Um, an approach is needed that aims at supporting value chain development, skills development, um, and the improvement of the overall business climate. Um, partnerships with government, with private sector, and with international organizations are essential to help uh, ensure the right business and regulatory conditions for investment. Um, and finally, uh, this is what the AU and the EU are trying to implement through their dialogue and political cooperation, as well as AU-EU agribusiness platform.